Greetings to you all and welcome. My name is Michael Spath and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition and the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. This is the second of four webinars designed for congregational use, digging more deeply into our 2021 United Church of Christ General Synod Resolution passed overwhelmingly with 85% of the vote, Declaration for a Just Peace Between Palestine and Israel. It's a landmark resolution among Christian denominations in its designation of Israel's oppression of Palestinians as sin, the subject of our first webinar, and apartheid, today's subject. We'll also be discussing in webinar three, the need for a political solution based on a human rights approach, and webinar four, the pervasiveness of Christian Zionism, not only among evangelical churches, but in mainline churches and in American civil religion. It's also important to note that the declaration draws on over 50 years of United Church of Christ resolutions. It's informed by the witness of our ecumenical partners, and especially the witness of our Palestinian Christian partners, in particular, the 2009 Kairos Palestine document and the 2020 Kairos Palestine Cry for Hope, a Call for Decisive Action. Today's webinar is entitled, Israel's Oppression of Palestinians, It is Apartheid. And with our three distinguished panelists, Rifat Kassis, coordinator of Kairos Palestine, leader of Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, and founder and former general director of Defense for Children International Palestine. Rabbi Brian Walt, South African-born anti-apartheid activist, founder and rabbi emeritus of Philadelphia's congregation Mishkan Shalom, and member of the Rabbinical Council of Jewish Voice for Peace. And Hegai El-Ad, Executive Director of Beth Selim, a leading Israeli human rights organization that th just this past January in a landmark document called Israel an Apartheid Regime. Welcome to you all. So let's get right into it. Here's the salient part of the United Church of Christ resolution. We reject any laws and legal procedures which are used by one race or religion or political entity to enshrine one people in a privileged legal position at the expense of another, including Israel's apartheid system of laws and legal procedures. So Rifat, apartheid, a systemic, a systemic structural term. Uh, the declaration is our church response to the Palestinians' cry for hope, which calls Israel an apartheid state according to international law. Why did you decide to use the word apartheid now? Thank you, Michael. Uh, simply because it was the time. You know, the, the question uh, whether Israel is guilty of the crime of apartheid should not be determined based on tactics and uh, possible sensitivities between Christian communities and Jewish communities. It is very serious and it's caused so much suffering and it needs to be based on facts and international law. You know, when we were uh, discussing uh, before we launched Kairos Palestine, uh, apartheid was uh, on the table. At that time, we chose not to, uh, not to mention the word in the body of the Kairos. Uh, we only mentioned uh, the, words, the word apartheid in the, uh, I would say, the cover letter, which, which came with the, with the Kairos. At that time, we thought maybe this is too early for our audience to hear this because uh, people might get engaged in uh, whether this is uh, a South African terminology, if this is the situation like South Africa, and this discussion could be happened at the expense of the content of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, the document itself. So we, we did not mention it. But two years after, 
uh, when we launched the Bethlehem Call, uh, which was the, the birth of the Global Cars for Justice Coalition, I think in that, in that document, we mentioned the word apartheid uh, and we connected uh, uh, to the, uh, I mean, to the situation itself. But later on, uh, we kept uh, analyzing and digging uh, the words and we provided uh, much more evidence uh, based on international law. And as you know, I mean, we are not a group of uh, specialists of international law, yeah? but we, were, we are activists. So we tried to build up uh, the, the mind of our audience until we reached the, 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 the level which we, I mean, in, in the cry for hope, uh, the word apartheid came as part of an analysis, uh, not just uh, using uh, the word. And I would say that it was uh, positioned itself well within the document and within uh, the, the, the audience uh, we are, I mean, uh, working with. Thank you, Rifat. Brian, you've written that uh, it was when you led a Rabbis for Human Rights trip in 2008 and walked Shihada Street uh, in Hebron, which many of us have. Um, you, you wrote, I know what apartheid is, and I was seeing it in front of me. Talk to us about that very personal moment for you. Well, Thank you for that question. I shared that moment actually with Reverend Ali Perry, who is on this call too and part of the initiative. Um, for me as a Jew and a rabbi who grew up in South Africa, the, I was deeply involved for many years. I helped found Rabbis for Human Rights North America. And in that context, we gave support to the Israel Committee Against Home Demolition and to Rabbi Eric Asherman. And I saw when I went on many, many trips to the West Bank with those organizations and others, including B'Tselem, I saw atrocities that were just looked like, felt like, smelled like what I knew from being a child. I saw home demolitions, my own father's store in South Africa lived in a, was located in a neighborhood called District 6, where all the people of color were expelled from that district during my life as a child. So I knew what home demolition was around. I saw people being stopped by pass law, by Israeli police and military, often every day in Jerusalem, and of course on the West Bank. I saw um, how Israeli police dealt with nonviolent demonstrations on the West Bank. All of that was about apartheid. What happened for me that day was that I was told that the street I was about to walk on was a sterile street. And I had been warned as an activist in the Jewish community, not to mention the A word, the word apartheid. I was interested that Rifat, you had a similar consideration even in issuing the Kairos document in 2009, it's around the same time. But I in the Jewish community was said, if you ever say it's like apartheid, you're gone. So, and at that moment, I decided that I would never refrain from using that term again. And I, um, I must say that, that it's been, a struggle for me to keep my word on that question, because in South Africa, there never was a sterile street that was a white street. South Africa was a disgusting and despicable system of apartheid, but I never walked on a whites only street. I had to come to Israel, my people's country, or at least what Israel thinks of itself as the Jewish country to walk on a Jewish only street. And it just shocked me. It felt to me as a rabbi, like what in Yiddish you would say, a shanda. It's just a, a, an absolute shameful act. Thank you, Brian. Haggai, hey, uh, B'Tselem has been documenting Israeli human rights violations with over 180 reports in, uh, since 1989. Your report from this past January uh, was a bombshell. You point out in the preamble that no longer do you use terms like 
prolonged occupation or one state reality, but instead, this is not democracy plus occupation. This is apartheid between the river and the sea. Tell us about what brought you to designate it uh, in such a way. Thank you. Um, so the Salem has been documenting and advocating on this issue since it was established back in uh, 1989, so just over three decades ago. And during these years, uh, both the reality on the ground uh, has changed and also the internal thinking and analysis in the organization uh, has developed. And the terms that, that you mentioned, uh, you know, us moving from talking about occupation to prolonged occupation to one state reality are an expression of uh, both the reality on the ground shifting and our uh, response to these changes. Uh, but recently, we came to the conclusion that all this has not been sufficient. Uh, and in fact, what has to happen is an analysis that looks at the entire area under Israel's control, which is the, a departure from where B'Tselem used to focus its attention. We exclusively only looked at the situation in the occupied Palestinian territories beyond the Green Line, in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, and in East Jerusalem. Uh, but we came to the conclusion that to make a fair analysis of a, a regime's uh, substance, you have to look at the entire area under that regime's control. And that entire area is the entire area between the river and the sea, where 14 million people live. We have demographic parity, about half of them are Jewish individuals, like myself, about half of them are Palestinians. Uh, and what is very clear uh, is that that regime is a regime that is looking to um, further and further establish the supremacy of one group of people, Jews, at the expense of the other group, the other half of the population, Palestinians. Um, and that is apartheid. It doesn't have to be identical to the situation in South Africa. Indeed, it's not. There are some differences, obviously, and no two historical analogies are identical, nor should we expect that. But the essence of the regime group supremacy of one group over another is the same essence. And because of that, the appropriate term to describe this reality is apartheid. Hey, Guy, you were anticipating my next question. Uh, talk a little bit more about what Jeff Halper and others have talked about as the matrix of control. Give us some examples of what that looks like uh, within uh, uh, the boundaries of Israel itself. And uh, we'll talk about the West Bank with, uh, and the Palestinian Tories with Rifat, but uh, talk about this matrix of control and maybe with some examples. Yeah, so one key aspect of this control, like, you know, maybe like the, the meta aspect is Israel's ability to get away with it. And because of that, yeah. there's also like, you know, the inherent rejection that we're offering in our position paper that you've mentioned of this other worldview a worldview that is a false one of a permanent democracy inside the green line to which a, a temporary occupation is attached. So that's the worldview that insists on looking at Israel forever as this two regime reality in which there is a democracy on one side of the green line and a temporary occupation on the other side of the green line. Um, that worldview has become completely detached from reality, right? You need to put aside major facts of the way life is between the river and the sea to continue to pretend that indeed these are two separate regimes. No, these are not two separate regimes. This is a single regime between the river and the sea. And that regime applies full rights and protections only to Jewish individuals and different levels of oppression and different levels of denial of rights to Palestinians, right? So Palestinians have a variety of lesser options as provided to them uh, by the Israeli regime. From second class citizenship, if you're a member of the minority of Palestinians, a fragment of the Palestinian population that are citizens of the state of Israel, second class citizenship, or a third class designation if you're a permanent resident uh, in occupied and illegally annexed East Jerusalem, uh, or if you're a Palestinian in the rest of the West Bank, 
that wasn't formally annexed to Israel proper, or if you're one of 2 million Palestinians that are locked up in what has become one of the largest open air prisons on the planet in the Gaza Strip, right? Uh, so there are differences. We're not saying that the level of oppression of Palestinians is the same everywhere. It's not the same everywhere. There are differences in nuances, but that doesn't diminish from the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that there isn't a single square inch within the river and the sea in which a Jewish individual and a Palestinian individual are equal. Thank you, Haggai. Brian, when you wrote about the B'Tselem report, uh, on apartheid, you, you referenced Nathan Thrall's term, the separate regime's delusion. What did he, what do you mean by that term? Well, I mean exactly what Haggai just said, that is the illusion that there's a democracy on one side and that there's a temporary um, occupation on the other side that's in the process of being changed into a democracy. Um, this is the underpinning of support for a two-state solution. It is what animates liberal Zionists, that somehow there would be this um, change on that somehow they two different regimes. And in fact, what I've learned over time is that of course they're deeply the same regime because one thing that most Jews never acknowledge, and I must say even many liberal Israelis don't acknowledge, and that is that in order for there to be a Jewish state with Jewish supremacy as part of the state, which had to be, the, the, what happened to the Palestinians was not uh, a, a mistake. It was what was intended. There were 700, there were a million people living on that territory. And for Jews to create a state which would be a democracy only by getting a majority, it would have to somehow diminish the number of Palestinians. And Israel's strategy since before 1948, since 1937, when the Zionist movement already, and even earlier, talked about the issue of transfer, has been planning for there to be Jewish supremacy by means of Jewish immigration and also discouraging Palestinian. Um, so this issue of that delusion, in some ways you asked me in 2008 what happened to me, I was a liberal Zionist, and I think in 2008, I realized that delusion that I had. Until this day, I'm in argument, obviously, with most of my rabbinic colleagues who are strong supporters of a, of a two-state solution in a, in a time when the, it's absolutely clear that what's happening in the West Bank is merely a continuation of what happened in 1947. And it's going to end in the same way. And it is present in the same way. Thank you. Uh, Rifat, uh, I'm going to ask you a big question. Uh, talk to us about how such an apartheid regime impacts Palestinians, not only in the West Bank where you live in Beit Sahor, but also uh, Palestinians living within Israel, you know, second class citizenship, lack of mobility, separation of families, etc. Talk to us about the, the reality of lived life. You know, I, I don't know uh, enough on Palestinians living uh, inside, uh, inside Israel, but I can tell you many stories uh, even about myself and about my family. Uh, for instance, uh, I have uh, brothers uh, who were in Germany during the 1967 war and they just lost uh, their right to return. Although they were not refugees as such, but they lost their right of return. Uh, my wife, uh, her uncle, he lives in Turan, which is a village not far from Nazareth. Uh, he died, but she couldn't attend his funeral uh, last year because uh, she needed a permit, which was not allowed uh, to get one. Uh, for me personally, I am not allowed to go to Jerusalem uh, because I cannot obtain uh, permits. Uh, so even uh, worshiping in Jerusalem is, is not allowed. Uh, one of my niece, her, her, her father is from Jerusalem and her mother from Beit Sahur. Uh, she was born in Beit Sahur, not in Jerusalem. She's now 25 years old and she doesn't have any paper. She doesn't have a birth certificate. She doesn't have an ID. 
and she is one of maybe 8,000 uh, cases similar to, to her case. Uh, I mean, to, to mention also the, the revocation of the ID cards if you live in, in Jerusalem and work in the West Bank or vice versa, if you are unable to prove that your center life uh, is, uh, is in Jerusalem. Uh, the movement restrictions, which I mean uh, imposed on every one of us, uh, this uh, regime of, of, of permits, uh, when you are unable to move from one area to, to another, and I mean, if I want to mention uh, uh, children who are imprisoned, uh, tortured, ill-treated, uh, I mean, every single aspect of, of our life is subject to this kind of, of, of treatment and, and uh, suppression. Thank you, Rifat. Uh, our United Church of Christ Declaration references apartheid in South Africa Jim Crow in the United States uh, South between Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Movement, and Israel's 2018 nation state law. So I want to ask you about uh, the inherent racism uh, of apartheid. Uh, so, Hegai, tell us how your apartheid report addresses the legal structures in, enshrined in. Israel's nation state law, you've called it, but Selim has called it uh, the Israeli strategy, divide, separate, rule. Absolutely. But maybe just before I go there, I, I just want to say a few words about the, the two-state solution because it's been referenced already in this, uh, in this conversation. And I'm kind of confident that, you know, many of the participants today like have 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 heard that uh, for you know for for many years already uh, so like apartheid might seem relatively new but two state solution that's something that everyone's familiar with and i i think it's essential uh, that uh, you know we take a, you know a, a sledgehammer to that <laughs> lie uh, and you know expose it for for what it is uh, because, as I said, like one of you know the, the cornerstones of Israel's success in getting away with this reality, you know, one of it is you know the pretense that Israel is a democracy. Another one is the two-state solution, like you know the endless uh, presentation of that uh, potential future, right? As if you know everything's negotiable. As if in the meantime there's a quote-unquote status quo, and nothing changes. Uh, and so on. Obviously, that is absolutely not the way things are. Like Israel's approach is that, you know, what mine is mine it was, and what yours is negotiable. And in the meantime, I'm eating it up, right? There is no status quo. The only thing that is static is the ongoing oppression by Israel of Palestinians and this possession of Palestinians from their lands, right? And if you think of the, you know, generation since the beginning of Oslo, Israel has more than tripled the number of settlers living in the occupied West Bank. And if you take a short trip around you know, Jerusalem these days, then you will see the huge investments being made by Israel now in permanent infrastructure, you know, tunnels and bridges and highways and underpasses and whatnot that are not temporary and that are part of like, you know, literally paving the way for not just you know, 700,000 Jewish settlers in the occupied territories, but making way for like a million settlers, right? So think of like, you know, th this buzz in the background of like two state solution, while in the meantime, reality is being changed day in and day out all the time at the expense of the rights and lands and lives of Palestinians. Uh, and part of what has happened in recent years is that there was gradually less lip service to two state solution and more honesty. Right, uh, you know, statements like you know, Israel will have permanent control over the entire territory. No single settlement will be removed. The Jordan Valley will remain under Israel's control forever. So, some more transparency, uh, some more uh, sincerity uh, in speaking. You know, the spelling out the the silent parts out out loud, out loud in terms of the genuine intentions. Of, of Israel, but I think anyone that's been following the the, the reality on the ground don't, doesn't need those kind of statements to see where this is going and where this has already arrived. 
And in that sense, and here I, I, I'm looping back to the, to the question, uh, I think it's also a, an analogy with the nation state law, right? Because the nation state law in 2018 codified at the constitution, constitutional level, a policy-based discrimination against Palestinians in the state of Israel, right? Um, but don't get it wrong. It's not that that kind of discrimination and dispossession has waited until 2018. No, that has been the policy since the state was established in 1948. So for seven solid decades, that's what Israel did to Palestinians with no need for the nation state law through other laws and through other policies, right? The only thing that happened in 2018 is to take that or pre-existing reality and shouting it, you know, at the most visible way as a chapter in Israel's, you know, in the making constitution. Um, and in that sense, it's a moment of, of clarity. It's a moment of, of coming out. And in a sense, this is one of the essential uh, distinctions between apartheid South Africa and apartheid Israel, right? South Africa uh, pr pronounced itself as apartheid. Israel has always refused to, you know, not only not to admit that, but to insist that it's in fact a democracy. And in 2018, with the nation state law, it's a step towards sincerity, it's a step towards transparency, but it doesn't begin the discrimination or the theft of Palestinian lands. It just elevates it to that kind of like basic law level. Thank you, Hegai. Uh, Rifat, last year, Kairos Palestine expressed its unequivocal support for the Black Lives Movement here in the United States, saying that it was a Kairos moment, an opportunity to recognize, quote, the many expressions of Black Palestinian solidarity over decades. What led uh, Kairos Palestine to uh, uh, issue this statement? Yeah, I think uh, this it was is a strong unity. statement, a good statement. Yeah, yeah. This is unity of the oppressed. Uh, I think uh, we Palestinians, uh, we are very sensitive when it comes to oppression, uh, regardless of who's initiating this and who's the victim. In the same token, uh, Michael, uh, Kairos Palestine, we started a series of meetings, uh, for instance, with the Dalits in India. Uh, and the reason for this is to, uh, to compare, to, to unite, uh, to draw lessons, uh, and the same thing we did even before we launched Kairos Palestine, we went to South Africa to learn better. Uh, so this comes uh, as part of uh, our understanding that we need to get united in order to, to defeat uh, the, the oppressors. Uh, so it, it is, it is a, a usual thing and it, it comes I mean, as part of our philosophy and our uh, policy to do so. Thank you, Rifat. Brian, uh, you've addressed, uh, I mean, you've lived it, right? In South Africa, you've addressed both apartheid in South Africa and the systemic racism in our country and connected it with Israel as an apartheid state. Talk to us about uh, your understanding from your own personal experience. Um, well, I've had the privilege, to use a <laughs> term, uh, to be a privileged white person in America and in South Africa and a privileged Jew in Israel. And those three systems are very alike, have very, uh, have very many common characteristics. For me, what it meant in Israel was that I was given benefits. I mean, in South Africa, it was clear and I was given, um, I was given the, all the benefits of white privilege, even though I was Jewish. There was some anti, some serious anti-Semitism amongst, particularly amongst Afrikaner people, and some among English. But in general, my community was shamefully silent as a community on apartheid, while many Jews who were not connected religiously with the community, for the most part, were radicals and important change agents in South Africa. In America, 
Um, in Israel, I again got my benefits. I came to Israel when I was 17 years old. I got um, compensation, tuition paid at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, all kinds of housing benefits and so on, because Israel relies on Jews immigrating to South Africa to solve the fundamental problem, which is not democracy. The fundamental problem that Israel always faces is demography, because it's impossible to get that to happen without some cruelty and really barbaric cruelty, as we're hearing today. It's impossible to get there. In America, it was a little different, I must say. America, I came here after the civil rights um, movement had achieved some, some rights in America. And I thought I was coming to a country that had solved the issue of racism until I found out that racism in America operates very quietly. So my, uh, we discovered in um, my wife at that time and I discovered um, that um, apartment block that we would go to frequently to pray with, to eat Sabbath meals after going to uh, pray in the morning on Shabbat was a block that didn't allow any people of color to live in that apartment. And it was just similar to that issue that walking down the street in Shuhada Street, it was another moment of, wow, just like I didn't understand it. Like there's no sign in South Africa, apartheid was crude, brutal, it was up there, whites only, blacks here, so on. It was not, there wasn't anything to be ashamed of. And here in America, in liberal Philadelphia, post civil rights, I was encountering racism there. And of course I've been awakened as many whites have in more recent years by the writings of many um, African-American and people of color in America about their experience in racism and how it continues even in the liberal parts of America. And so I very much see myself as being involved. My involvement in solidarity with the Palestinian people as a Jew is very much part of and intertwined with undoing my own racial bias and also confronting the ways in which racism still lives in contexts which I think of as liberal or open and also to see them as systemically part of America. Thank you. I, I wanna ask you three now about the, the dangerous uh, heretical theology, uh, a, a theology that conflates uh, a theology with an unjust political system, apartheid, that undergirds these practices of preferencing one people over another, discrimination, exclusion, separation, apartheid. Um, uh, Haggai, uh, the Betzalem report talks about Israel's practice, quote, of Judaizing the area. Now, I realize it's not a, only a religious term, it's a political term as well, but it conflates it. Uh, Judaizing the area based on the mindset that land is a resource meant almost exclusively to benefit the Jewish public. Tell us what Judaizing uh, looks like. Yeah, um, it's one of the major practices in that ma matrix of control that Israel uh, applies. Uh, and you know, the two main features of, of that matrix is the, you know, the, the management uh, of, uh, of demography between the river and the sea. Uh, and the management of, of land. So who can live there uh, and what happens to the, to the land? Uh, the re-engineering of demography and the re-engineering of, uh, of space. These are the two essential aspects. And if you look at the, you know, what happens to land between the river and the sea, then basically what you see is the same picture with, you know, the different mechanisms. Uh, which Israel would, you know, always insist that are all legal mechanisms. Uh, and through these mechanisms, land that used to be Palestinian uh, moves uh, to the control of the state and then is reallocated for the development uh, of towns and communities uh, for the Jewish population. And you've seen that process since 1948 uh, inside Israel proper. Uh, and you've seen that process since 1967 in the occupied territories. 
Um, sometimes it's even the same, the same mechanisms. Uh, for instance, the usage of designating land uh, for military purposes, uh, and then somehow that purpose uh, setting itself aside, and that land that used to be Palestinian, after uh, it's been taken uh, through a military excuse, is then uh, re-designated uh, uh, for Jewish development. Uh, but there are also many other mechanisms, uh, some of them exclusively used inside the Green Line, some of them beyond the Green Line, sometimes both. So state land, nature reserves, military training, confiscations, uh, and so on, all of these variations of them have been used. And again, one of the essential aspects that's another key way in which Israel gets away with it is also the insistence that all of this is done legally and that there's legal oversight and there's a, a legal regime or a planning regime or both uh, that uh, make all this somehow legal. Uh, but the fact that the laws are construed in a way that enables all this doesn't make any of it just. It just demonstrates the way that this is not rule of law, but rule by law, that the laws have been uh, constructed to be part of the problem, so to enable this regime to do what it desires and to get away with it. And if you need like, you know, one example, one current example uh, of how this is so, then think about the Palestinian neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem. Right, uh, yeah. well, the laws are used for Jewish settlers to throw Palestinian families out of their homes in a reality in which those Palestinian families that have property inside Israel proper cannot reclaim their property. All of it done by law. Thank you. Uh, Rifat, say a word about the problem of Christian Zionism for the Palestinian Christian population, but indeed for all Palestinians. You know, we, we Palestinians, uh, as, as we wrote in Cairo's document, I think we were neglected and bypassed by many Christians all over the world, not just Christian Zionists. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we were discovered recently. Uh, and sometimes uh, I, I got shocked. I mean, uh, people still asking me uh, when you were converted to Christianity from where you are originally, etc. So uh, uh, Palestinians and Palestinian Christians, uh, we were all the time uh, the victim of this uh, ignorance. Uh, and sometimes we just put the blame on Christian Zionism for for their blind loyalty to the state of Israel and to what they do. But actually the problem comes also from the mainstream church's uh, theology. Uh, yeah. That uh, till now they are uh, crippled and, and struggling with the guilt feeling. Uh, so it's kind like of post Holocaust uh, theology. So they are crippled at that, at that corner. But of course, Christian Zionism, uh, I mean, it, it, definitely they do, not, uh, they do not see us at all. And when they see us, they see us as obstacle uh, in front of God's uh, plans to, 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 to the area. So we are not just neglected, but we are a, a problem for them. And uh, as if... Uh, I mean, uh, ethnic cleansing us, uh, putting us aside, this is part of, of God's plan for, for, for this area. This kind of, of theology we spoke about in Cairo's document and also in the cry for hope, and even in the open letter for the World Council of Churches and, uh, and the ecumenical movement at large. But let me say something that it's not just a theological issue. First, we should also, I mean, uh, confess that there is pro-Israeli lobbies in, in, in many churches, uh, and these lobbies are very effective. Uh, and as I said, the Holocaust guilt, the policies, uh, I mean, they, they are adopting uh, 
the failure of, of, of Christians to, to, to do more, to, to have done more during the Second World War till today, this is alive in the churches. But also uh, today there is a huge fear of being labeled anti-Semitic. And this is encouraged and manipulated by Israel and Israeli lobbies. Uh, the concept of anti-Semitism, especially today with the IHRA, a new definition has been expanded to cover not only hatred of Jews, but criticism of, of, of Israel. So the whole, this is, I, I also call it a whole system of matrix designed uh, to strip the Palestinians their rights and also I mean, I, I feel bitter sometimes when, uh, when I start talking about uh, my suffering and the suffering of my people, and immediately my audience will label me as an anti-Semite and uh, someone who, I mean, as if we are not allowed even to talk about, about our suffering in, in a very clear, uh, clear manner and clear attitude. Thank you. Thank you for that, Rifat. Uh, Brian, uh, I'd like for you to talk to us about the problematic, uh, even false Jewish theologies that equate Judaism with Zionism. Thank you, Michael. I, I feel called to respond to what Rifat just said, because I feel as a Jew, I want to say that I totally reject the use of the Holocaust as a weapon to silence you and your people. I think that is a sin on the part of the Jewish people, and I apologize for that. And I struggle, along with some other Jews, not enough yet, against using Jewish suffering in order to silence Palestinians. And the way that's been written into law in American states is just disgusting and a terrible um, crime by Jews to shut down Palestinian um, natural demand for freedom, for justice, for equality. So Michael, as regards your um, question about chosenness and so on, I am a reconstructionist rabbi. What I, Mordechai Kaplan is the founder of our movement. And the most important idea for me, why I became a reconstructionist rabbi was that he believed that Judaism needed to be reconstructed in a democratic setting, and that that involved a whole new idea about how we think about God, about our sacred texts, about our liturgies, and so on, and that we would need to reconstruct them. He thought there was one idea that we couldn't reconstruct, and that was the idea of chosenness. And so reconstructionists have changed the liturgy completely in terms of any reference with that God has chosen us from all peoples. Um, we are chosen with all peoples. We are given a promised land with all peoples. It, he, um, that is how I understand those. And I think the exceptionalism that often emerges from chosenness is something that is a betrayal of Judaism, as I understand it, in our time. Um, I think that's all I'd say now. If you have a follow-up, you can, yeah. Thank you. I do want to take the theological question even further. Our United Church of Christ declaration is very clear. We affirm that all people living in Palestine and Israel are created in the image of God and that this bestows ultimate dignity and sacredness to all. So, uh, well, Brian, let's just come back to you uh, as a rabbi. You remind us that, quote, at the heart of the Torah, is a sacred commitment to the dignity of all human beings. That quote, support for the rights of Palestinians is central to our Judaism. Right. So say more about how your Judaism informs your pal Palestinian solidarity. Thank you. So for me, uh, my <coughs> Judaism is integrally connected with justice as a 11th grader in a Jewish day school in South Africa, I encountered this guy called Amos, who was a Hebrew prophet in, in the land, in the promised land, and he, or the land of promise, however you want to uh, think of it, that who said justice will well up like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. And along with the other prophets said that the ethics of justice, freedom, and equality was more important, was to be, have primacy 
over ritual. Ritual was in the service, service of God, it was in the service of God, which would be manifested in justice, equality, and freedom for all people. I am a prophetic Jew. It's not to put me as an outlier. The rabbis who created our liturgy have all Jews read the passage from Isaiah on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, the most sacred day in the Jewish calendar at the most um, sacred time to read the prophecy from Isaiah who walked into the temple in Jerusalem and castigated the Jewish people, the Israelites at that time for their unethical behavior and said, is that what God demands of you? God does not want to fast and all these rituals God wants similar to Isaiah, to Amos, that God wants Jews to act for justice. That's how I understand Judaism. Judaism is based on that all human beings are created in the image of God. Um, Rabbi Azai says, Ben Azai says, that that is the most important principle of Torah. I believe that's true. And I believe it's Judaism is totally consonant with the Palestinian demand for freedom, justice, and equality um, in our time. And that's how I understand. And I want to say, I act on this issue as an activist, not in spite of being Jewish, but because I'm Jewish. Yeah. Yeah, that's clear. That's clear from everything you uh, say and everything you write and your activism, Brian. Thank you. Rifat, uh, the cry for hope from 2020 says that the situation for Palestinians presents the church with a status confessionis that, quote, the very being of the church, the integrity of the Christian faith, and the credibility of the gospel is at stake. What do you mean by this? Yeah, I think what we meant with this, that uh, trying to, to, to put a theological understanding to the oppression of the Palestinians to give a justification for this oppression uh, using the Bible, using uh, the, the, the good message of, of the Bible and to transform it into a bad message for the Palestinians, this should not happen. And, and uh, using the, 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 the Bible as, as a political program, uh, a, a tool for uh, one people to dominate another, another people and to justify it theologically, this is not a, a confession which we should uh, agree with. So uh, we used maybe uh, words which were used in the Second World War, uh, I mean, uh, rejecting the, the Nazism at that time. And I think what was, uh, I mean, acceptable uh, uh, at that time, it should not be acceptable uh, today. The same way we rejected uh, Nazism, we should also reject apartheid. We should reject the oppression of the, of the Palestinian people. So this is exactly what we meant with this, that no use for ju theological justification for this oppression. And uh, thank you, Rifat and, and Haggai. Um, uh, but Selim is not a religious organization. B'Tselem is a, a human rights uh, organization, yet the name B'Tselem literally means in the image of, coming from Genesis 1, uh, 27, and God created humankind in God's image. And you go on to say, uh, the name expresses the Jewish and universal moral edict to respect and uphold the human rights of all people. And isn't it true, Haggai, in, in this way, Judaism at its best coincides with it embodies international, the concern for international human, uh, human rights. Please respond. Thank you. I, I was about to, to mention it myself uh, when you were quoting from the declaration that it, some of the language coincides with the, the very name of, uh, of the organization. And I guess one of the, the points that people wanted to make, you know, back in 89, when the organization was founded, the name was given to the organization by the late uh, um, member of Knesset, uh, Yossi Sarid, uh, to, to make the point that um, as, a, as a human rights organization, 
we're not uh, from somewhere else. We're, we're local. We're, you know, we're from the land. Uh, and this is what, uh, what we believe in, in a way that's both universal uh, and for some of us uh, also, also Jewish. So that was a very important statement uh, from the get-go, from the very uh, identity of the of the organization. Uh, I have to say that you know, you know, from you know my general uh, understanding, right? There are like you know many ways to think about you know uh, Jewish faith, as there are many ways to think about Christianity or other faiths. Uh, and in the worst of these ways, then these are used as justifications for, you know, unspeakable atrocities. Uh, and in the best of their interpretations, uh, they're used to, you know, advance shared humanity and justice and uh, equality. Um, so uh, eventually, I think it boils down to the, you know, the values that one chooses to, to embrace and what one insists on reading. Uh, from one's uh, identity uh, and background, uh, more or less religious, into the kind of reality we wanna we wanna live in, and I also wanna you know just zoom in for a second about the you know the, the words you know a, a cry for hope, because uh, I, I thought about it, uh, it it resonated very strongly with me in, in the context of the of the apartheid position paper, right. It was important for us also like to spell out if you go to the, like the very end of that position paper that you know calling reality as it is apartheid back in January wasn't a moment of despair and in a way it was a cry for hope for us right uh, it's not that like we gave up on something it's a, a moment of clarity and with that clarity also the hope that with that cry we will move towards a correct analysis of the issue, which will put us uh, on a path towards justice, equality, and an end for apartheid and occupation. Thank you, Haga. I, I am gonna come back to that last statement uh, in, in just a few minutes with you with my last question, because I want you to even expand upon it because it's a powerful way to close uh, the, the document on apartheid from B'Tselem. But before I do that, I, I want to ask each one of you to get personal for a minute. Um, Brian, talk to us about some of the painful conversations you've had with Jewish friends and family members when you began to use the word apartheid. Yet, uh, nevertheless, you continue to uh, continue in your truth telling about what you've experienced. And what advice uh, would you give to Christians? whose advocacy and use of the term might alienate their Jewish friends? Well, like any activist, I have had many different um, reactions to the activism, not necessarily to the use of the word apartheid. Um, in my um, life, I, 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 my first pulpit, I, I lost the pulpit over support, over just even speaking about the Palestinians as a suffering people. Um, I faced death threats at that time, letters, all the kinds of things that activists uh, face I've had along the way. Apartheid is also hard for me to talk about in my family. Not all my family agrees with me. I have members of my family who disagree pretty strongly and so I have to navigate that and it's complicated. It's a complicated path. I have chosen as much as possible to not censor myself in terms of my own work, but in my family, I may not push at family events, particular political position because they're my family. And, and, this I, and I often can have conversations with them and I often um, can't. In my professional life, of course, it's quite a difficult thing as a rabbi to speak about um, Israel as an apartheid state. Um, it's quite difficult to speak about the truth of Israel because as Chagai pointed out, um, the truth has been hidden in a series of structures and ideologies and lies that have been told about the, um, about the reality um, I myself recall being told 
when I was also just a, a young guy, <laughs> maybe 16 years old, by Ben Gurion that no Palestinian was ever expelled from Israel. He knew he was lying. He knew he was lying. And he edited his diaries so as to exclude things that he didn't think want the world to know about what Israel did. And so it's a complicated um, journey. As regards talking to Christian allies um, about this, I think that it's very important for Christians to understand that when you talk to Jews about American Jews, that is not Jews in Israel, when you talk to American Jews about Israel, um, you're talking about an existential and emotional issue. You're not talking about, they're not, they're not reacting to you on the basis of rationality, right? Mostly they're reacting to you. They don't know much about Israel. What they know about Israel is what American culture teaches them about Israel. That's changing, but only slowly changing. Haggai is not invited to hundreds of synagogues to present his report. And mm -hmm. I, as one who support that report, am not invited to hundreds of synagogues to present it. I would go to any synagogue that would let me in to go and talk about that report and the Judaism that's behind that report and the urgency of that moral, but I won't be invited. So my community has a long way um, to, to go on that score. So it's an emotional issue. Jews don't know much about it. And Jews definitely don't know about things like the Nakba. They don't know about expulsions. They don't know about the creation. Of, of Israel in that way, and in order they know necessarily about the reality. Some do, but most don't. Secondly, most Jews see Israel as a response to the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, and want to be sure that Israel can continue to provide that safety for Jews. So somehow addressing that issue with compassion seems to me important. And lastly, and I could talk more about it, but I don't wanna take up time now, rather, um, Lastly, I think it's really important for Christians, like for me, to act on my faith. And if your faith tells you that Jesus of Nazareth um, and your own sacred scripture command you to stand with people who are being treated unjustly and to be a voice for justice and equality and freedom, which I believe Jesus taught, and I know you do, so um, go and do it. <laughs> go and do it and insist on it and not be badgered by that you're anti-Semitic. I imagine it's very painful. I get called an anti-Semite too. And I, it's a painful thing to do to okay. Christians because many Christians are not anti-Semitic at all. And it makes real Christian anti-Semitism really unable, to, unable for us Jews to deal with. I believe there is real Christian anti-Semitism. Absolutely. I'm sure Jews have suffered bitterly from Christian anti-Semitism, but using it as a political tool doesn't help us to meet with Christians who are sincerely wanting to deal with the legacy of anti-Semitism in the church and also wanting to support justice in the world for everyone, including Palestinians. Thank you very much, Brian. Rifat, uh, you have been a continued presence helping the United Church of Christ, of the Presbyterian Church USA and others uh, understand the reality on the ground in Palestine, which means you've helped them to deal with supporters. You mentioned the mainline churches too, there's a problem. And you've helped uh, various Palestine Israel networks navigate that, uh, navigate uh, those conversations with supporters of Israel in their own mainline denominations. What insights can you share from those experiences? You know, and honestly speaking, uh, I think uh, ignorance is a major problem. Uh, I believe in people, I believe in humanity, and I think all of us are built up to, to be merciful and, and to be human. The problem uh, that there is no clear and enough information sometimes, which makes it very difficult for some believers, uh, faithful people to understand the situation. Uh, that's why, for instance, in Kairos, Palestine, we said, come and see, because uh, we thought that to come and to see 
because many people come to our area, but they do not see. But if they come and, and see, this would be the first step for transformation. Uh, giving them uh, enough tools to analyze things, to see things as it is, uh, to, to try to help them get rid from their stereotypes and from their, I mean, everyone has his own, her own uh, stereotypes about things. So my personal experience is when I encounter uh, people and tell them the truth about the situation, uh, tell them the truth about the reality without any cosmetics, without any exaggeration, I can tell you many people uh, were transformed immediately. Uh, yeah. When people come to our area with open hearts and mind, they just need two hours to understand that this is an abnormal situation. This situation should not continue as it is. Of course, sometimes we face uh, people who try to philosophize, uh, to theologize things about promised land and chosen people, etc. And immediately when we confront them with that this is not an academic or intellectual exercise. This is a, a, a matter of life and death for people on both sides. So you need to be more careful in, in repeating these jargons without enough understanding of what these jargons are doing for the human beings. Because there are human beings on the ground, uh, there is bloodshed on the, on the ground, and your role should not be supportive of, of such a bloodshed instead of trying, uh, because I mean, all faiths, uh, they reject war, they reject uh, injustice. So this is the, the role you should, you should have, is to, to be more cautious in your uh, understanding, in your, in your justifications, in your arguments, and I feel personally when I have such encounters, uh, people are transformed, people become more uh, receptive, uh, especially that we in Kairos, Palestine, and I dare to say that in Kairos, Palestine, we Palestinian Christians spoke on, on, both, on behalf of both nations. We spoke on behalf of Jews, we spoke on behalf of Christians and Muslims. We are human beings, we want our future is connected. And that's why we need to draw a line to stop all these misery uh, and to look for, for a future, a prosper future, future without wars and without bloodshed. Thank you, Rifat. And Haggai, um, B'Tselem, you are no stranger to uh, the, the criticisms of anti-Semitism and others by the Israeli government. In fact, the Israeli government not unexpectedly called your report, quote, a collection of lies and fabrications bordering on anti-Semitic, which is part of the organization's ongoing campaign against Israel. Yet B'Tselem and New Haggai have remained strong and faithful uh, to the values of full human, political, and civil rights, human dignity, uh, so strong. Uh, how, how do you respond uh, to such criticisms and to keep the faith? I think the you know the criticism from the government is uh, you know sometimes un unpleasant, but I think the the key point is how intellectually weak that criticism is, right? Uh, there's almost never uh, any effort to argue with the facts that, you know, underlie, underpin our, our analysis. Instead of that, it's just a strategy of, uh, of shooting the messenger and trying to delegitimize it, right? Uh, so, you know, not even trying to, to argue with the facts is, uh, I think that's, that's very telling about the, the reality, but unfortunately, it's also quite effective for them, as already was mentioned a number of times during this conversation, uh, the usage of, uh, of smear, right? And, you know, smear against, uh, you know, Israelis would often come with accusations of treason, 
and smear against Palestinians would often come with accusations of terrorism and smear against internationals would often come with smear and the kind of accusations of, of anti-Semitism, right? Um, but I think that it's important to, you know, not lose focus that even if, you know, sometimes we have to face, uh, you know, unpleasant challenges, uh, the people that are on the front line of this injustice are our Palestinians, right? Living under this regime, including Palestinian human rights defenders. Uh, and Palestinian human rights defenders, and, you know, we're, we're having this conversation just a few weeks after the designation of, you know, six Palest key Palestinian organizations as terror entities. Uh, but that follows, you know, hundreds of other Palestinian groups that over the years uh, have been labeled as, you know, illegal associations by, by Israel. Uh, and Palestinian human rights defenders know that they can be arrested, they can be shot, they can be beaten, they can be put under a travel ban, they can be put under admissive detention. Uh, you know, what, what they face is, you know, the full onslaught of the powers that such a, you know, totalitarian oppressive regime can apply when it wishes to silence those that are fighting uh, for justice and, and freedom from it. Um, so I think, you know, acknowledging the, the courage of Palestinian rights defenders is part of what makes us strong and makes us committed to continuing this, this struggle. Thank you. Uh, and Hagai, I want to follow up with you. Uh, finally, uh, with all three of you, I'd like for you to all to address the urgency of the moment and your hope for the future and what gives you that hope. Hagai, you already referred to the ending of your report, but let me just repeat it for everyone to, to hear and then maybe expand upon what you said earlier. You said, calling things by their proper name, apartheid, is not a moment of despair, rather is a moment of moral clarity, a step on a long walk inspired by hope. See the reality for what it is, name it without flinching, and help bring about the realization of a just future. Say more. Please, thank you. Um, so first, I, I it was think a powerful, it, it was a powerful way to end, forgive me, but it was a powerful way to end the, the, the document. No, nothing to forgive, thank you. Um, first, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, it's difficult to inject a sense of urgency uh, to addressing an injustice that has been going on for such a, for such a long time. And I think it's also important to, to acknowledge that these are, you know, sad times. These are, you know, desperate times in many, in many ways. And it's difficult to see, uh, you know, the kind of dramatic departure uh, from these decades of oppression and injustice uh, that, that is needed. It's difficult to imagine that uh, coming to fruition any, 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 any time soon. I think it's also important to say that because unfortunately we need a, you know, a long breath in understanding that this is a struggle that is gonna be fought for, for quite some time looking forward. Um, so not to you know, portray things in, you know, in a brighter uh, light than uh, where, where they are. Having said that, um, I think it is important to first understand that, as I said before, there is no status quo and, and that there's a price being paid for this brutality all the time uh, by Palestinians uh, in life and blood and land and the ability to fulfill one's abilities and in a million different other ways in which Israel oppresses Palestinians and robs them from their dignity. Uh, and with that in mind, you know, think about the millions of people that are facing this, this reality, uh, and that should give all of us like a sense of urgency day in and day out, no matter how long this injustice uh, is allowed to, to continue. And also, I think it's important to acknowledge that this is a growing consensus, right? I mean, Palestinian human rights advocates have been saying that this is apartheid for many years. Uh, and now, 
this is, you know, finally, perhaps belatedly, this is becoming an international consensus uh, between Palestinian, Israeli, and international human rights organizations, right? Uh, so, you know, El Haq and many other Palestinian groups have been at this already for quite some time. B'Tselem since January, Human Rights Watch since April, uh, and I'm confident and others also will come to this uh, consensus in the coming in the coming months. And with that in mind, uh, I think it I hope it puts all of us on a better trajectory uh, towards a radically different future than the kind of injustice that Palestinians have been living under for such a long time. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I sense a real urgency uh, too in your writing because of your solidarity with Palestinians and their suffering, but also uh, in your concern for what the oppression of Palestinians is doing to the Jewish people. And talk about that, please. Haggai mentioned we live in, des we live in desperate times. And not only on this issue, we live in a desperate time in America, we live in a desperate time as a planet, we live in a desperate time in terms of, of many, many, and we live in a desperate time in Israel, Palestine. And yes, I feel the Jewish people live in a desperate time, not only because for the lives and safety and flourishing of both Jews and Palestinians in that land together in some unimagined different kind of country. Um, but there are two um, rabbinic phrases that I'd like to end with. One is, uh, they say, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just do it in Hebrew better first, because hasman katsar hamluchar merubah, that the, the time is short, and the work we have to do, the service of God that we need to do, the service of the highest good that we need to do, is immense, and it is upon us. And the rabbis teach that you are not responsible, you're not obliged to complete all the work. And God knows as a person who's about to turn 70, I don't think I'm going to see all the work be done. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure that my children will, unfortunately. So the melacha is the, 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 you're not, and you're not obligated to finish the work, but you're also not allowed to free, absolve yourself of any responsibility. Jews need to take responsibility for what has happened to Palestinians. We need to face that. We need to do what rabbis would call tshuva. We need to do repentance. We need to repent for what has been done. We need to do all the stages of repentance, which are quite rigorous in Judaism. We do them on the Day of Atonement, and we need to do them in regard to Palestinians. We need to atone. We need to confess, which is the first step. We need to correct the wrong in some way. We need to redress the wrong that was done. And we need to commit ourselves not to do it again. And I believe that's the task of the Jewish people, the particular task of the Jewish people in regard to the Palestinians in our time, alongside with our responsibilities as citizens of other countries, in my case, the United States, and as citizens of the world in a planet that is threatened. Thank you, Brian. Rafat, uh, Kairos Palestine's cry for hope quotes from the 2017 statement from a coalition of Palestinian Christian organizations, things are beyond urgent. We're on the verge of a catastrophic collapse. This is no time for shallow diplomacy, Christians. And yet the cry for hope also talks about uh, its hope and especially the logic of love. Uh, tell us more about that. Yeah, you were you referred to the uh, to the open letter, which was uh, written by the uh, by many Christian uh, organizations, the coalition of Christian organizations. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I think I mean uh, there is no justice in our land, discrimination and inequality inequality, military occupation, systematic oppression are the rule. Uh, I think in that letter we mentioned 
the impossible moment. And we were afraid to reach this moment. And I am afraid that we are reaching this impossible moment. Today, I mean, we are struggling to keep our hope alive. We are struggling with our youth to keep hope, to stay in the land uh, and not to search for other opportunities outside the land. Uh, I am not exaggerating to say that uh, we are about to lose this hope, uh, Michael. Uh, we are about to lose our hope with the international community. We are about to lose hope with our ability uh, to confront such an oppression and, and to, to search for a better life for all. You are right. I mean, Kairos Palestine, not just cry for hope, was built on the logic of love. Uh, and for us, love is, is a resistance as well, a loving resistance. This is what we call it in Kairos, uh, in Kairos uh, Palestine. And uh, I mean, uh, when we say that the, the, uh, the Palestinians and their hope, I mean, we tried everything. We tried all kinds of resistance and all of them in vain. Today, unfortunately, I mean, Israel has more uh, normal relations with, with Arab countries than what the Palestinians have with the, with, the, with the Arab countries. So we spoke about the logic of love because we feel that uh, this, this conflict, this, I mean, I, I don't like to call it a conflict, this should be solved uh, based on the on 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 the on humanity, based on uh, the conviction that uh, our future are connected with each other. And and we said in, in Kairos Palestine, I mean, either we go together for a prosper future, or we will continue together living in such a, a bloodshed. Uh, Personally speaking, I feel the urgency for my Christian community. Uh, and as we wrote in the open letter, uh, we are at, at the, the edge. Uh, we are losing on daily basis. We are losing members of our community. Uh, what we lack, we lack political stability. We lack a solution. Uh, we need a, a vision for, for the present and for the future. And without this, yes, I am, I am pleading for my, my community that without, without peace, we will never manage to preserve our existence and presence in this country. Uh, I'm talking about the, mainly about the Christian community. Yeah. Well, folks, uh, um, I'm going to ask each one of the panelists to share a closing word. But before uh, I let them do that, uh, if you haven't already, and you want to be informed about the rest of our series and the curriculum to follow, please type in the chat room your name and your email address, and we'll make sure that you're on our list. I also want to remind you that this is the second of four programs in a series hosted by the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network, focused on our 2021 General Synod Declaration for a Just Peace between Palestine and Israel. Haggai, uh, your closing thoughts. Maybe I'll just say a few words about the, you know, the, the, the current context vis-a-vis uh, -vis US foreign policy, uh, because I think there, there's a lot of international responsibility, international acquiescence, uh, international underwriting of Israeli policies against Palestinians. But I don't think that there's like any international actor that is like, you know, more responsible uh, for providing Israel uh, close to blanket protection so that it continue uh, with impunity to oppress Palestinians like the United States of, uh, of America. Uh, there have been uh, administrations that have been like more blunt about it, like the Trump administration. There's been administrations that have been like more obscure about it. Uh, but, you know, besides paying the occasional, occasional lip service to Palestinian rights, have we actually seen uh, in recent years any assertive international action backed by the U.S., led by the U.S., uh, to prevent what has been happening to, to proceed? We haven't. 
right? Uh, and the US continues to, you know, uh, veto resolutions at the Security Council uh, and provide Israel, you know, protection in numerous additional ways, both in the bilateral relationship and in the multilateral arenas. But eventually, uh, in, you know, genuine democracies, uh, there is um, a link between foreign policy and public opinion. And this is where I'm trying to talk to you know, everyone that's you know, listening to, to this. Uh, if, US for, you know, if, if public opinion globally, and also specifically in North America and in the US specifically, uh, would you know, waken up to the fact that this is going on, that the US is underwriting it, and that makes each and every one in the US, like in the US like complicit in a way in you know supporting this injustice and you know benefiting from it and to be outraged by that and to demand uh, from you know your government to genuinely align foreign policy with protection for human rights everywhere not to have an Israel exception so that Israel continue uh, with impunity to oppress Palestinians that would be very meaningful and I think that's an essential step that we need to take. And I am hoping that the growing consensus around apartheid will lead to that awakening of global public opinion. And that will lead to a change in the way the world addresses this injustice. That's my hope. Hey, Guy, uh, uh, I want to just uh, say thank you to you for joining us today. Uh, your insights uh, have been uh, so helpful for us, and uh, we appreciate the work of B'Tselem, and we appreciate uh, uh, how strong uh, its recent statement has been on apartheid, so thank you. Brian, uh, you're up. Your closing thoughts. Um, I rather just want to say that I am deeply moved by Chagai's work and commitment of B'Tselem and its report. I hope that many, many people, but I, especially as I work in the Jewish community, I hope many Jews read it. In seven pages, you put together a moral text that every Jew should read, study, and think about in terms of what it means in terms of our faith, and I thank you for that. And to Rifat, I want to thank you for your compassion, your love, your commitment to justice, and so too to the to the UU pin, um, UCC pin. For I almost got it wrong. Um, <laughs> Jewish denominations are much simpler; there are only three or four. But the UCC <laughs> uh, pin for organizing this, and to um, you, Michael, for putting this together um, today. And I want to say, in my own community, I am encouraged by the next generation who have a very different attitude towards Israel. I still have some hope for my generation, us uh, altakakas, old people, as they are called in, the, in, the, in this movement, are going to do good work, have done some good work, and hope to do more. But the new generation really sees Israel differently, and I believe it will change. Whether that will be in time so that Palestinians can enjoy freedom and justice. I hope it is. Um, so thank you so much. And it, I just feel I want to express my gratitude rather than say more than that. Just say that. You know, Brian, uh, what you've brought to us today is not only uh, uh, your, uh, your rabbinical understanding of human rights uh, and Jewish theology, but also if I can use a Christian term, the heart of a pastor. And uh, thank you. Thank you for your sharing today. Rifat, your closing thoughts. Yeah, I, there must be accountability. The international community must work to stop Israel's impunity. I mean, as Haggai said, Israel must respect its obligations under international law. I hope more churches will follow the United uh, the Church of Christ example and adopt the cry for hope and to work together. I think we need to, to work, to walk together and to keep the struggle alive. You need to intensify your advocacy work. I mean, this is something very, very helpful for us on the ground to know that we have friends, we have supporters, we have people who think of us. 
And thank you again for giving us this opportunity, Michael. Thank you all. And uh, Rifat, thank you. You know, you're, anyone who knows you knows that uh, you bring not only a sense of urgency uh, from your own life and, and a witness from your own life uh, to uh, what the documents have called a logic of love. You've embodied uh, uh, a, a logic of love and loving resistance in your life. And so we thank you for being a witness to us. I want to say thanks to the Executive Committee of the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network, to Reverend Ali Perry and Reverend Lauren McGrail, uh, our partners in this uh, effort. And we'll be in touch for the next in our series on our United Church of Christ uh, resolution, Declaration for a Just Peace in Palestine and Israel. Thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>